everybody. Welcome to our LA County Library virtual event, Creative Career Path. I'm Caroline Chang, Arts Program Manager at LA County Library, and I'll be your host today. And today's program is a part of a series exploring careers in entertainment, film, TV, and the media industries. And in today's program, director and producer Kimberly Browning will have a conversation with Michael Ramirez and Josh Jaggers. Now, I'm going to start by introducing our presenters today, but while I am doing that, we'd love to hear from you and learn a little bit more about who you are. Um, so say hello in the chat and share with us what you're hoping to get out of the conversation today and where you are at in your entertainment or visual effects uh, journey. Uh, so first, I'd like to introduce Kimberly Browning, who will be moderating our conversation. Kimberly is a filmmaker based in LA and is the founder and festival director of Hollywood Shorts Film Festival, which launched in 1998. She's an associate short film programmer at Tribeca Film Festival and a senior programmer at Catalyst Content Festival. She's been the executive producer of HBO Access since 2015 and is now part of the new Warner Media Access Programs team, developing emerging writers and directors in episodic television. We also have Michael Ramirez with us today. Um, he is a tracking, match moving, and layout artist. Uh, visual effects has been Michael Ramirez's passion for the last 26 years. His experience has ranged from uh, pre-visualization to particle effects with strong emphasis on 3D tracking, match moving, and layout work. Working behind the computer is not only his only skill, he has also worked a number of films on location, gathering lens and camera information, as well as setting up stages for blue screenshots. Michael has an extensive list of credits, working with some of the most prolific film and animation companies in the industry. His work includes lead tracking as Oh, his current work, I'm sorry. His current work includes lead tracking and as a layout artist at Encore Visual Effects, working on shows such as Seal Team, Narcos, Supergirl, Flash, Luke Cage, and Legends of Tomorrow. Uh, we also have Josh Jaggers with us with us here today. And Josh was recently named group president of VFX and Stereo, Stereo of DNEG, one of the world's leading visual effects and anim animation studios for feature film and television. Most recently, he served as senior VP at Legendary Entertainment in VFX and Stereo production, working on films including Dune, Godzilla vs. Kong, Godzilla King of Monsters, and Pokemon Detective Pikachu. Prior to that, he was VFX producer at Warner Brothers, having worked on productions including Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice, Justice League, and Man of Steel, and additional VFX producer credits include Hancock 2012 and Fast Five. Um, there's an amazing list of credits for these two amazing uh, people. So with that, I'll hand it over to Kimberly to start us off. Thank you, Caroline. Welcome, everybody. And I think the uh, long distance champagne goes to Emmanuel today, who's joining us from Ghana. That's amazing. So we hope that we give you a lot of inspiration and insight about the various amazing careers within the visual effects community. Michael, Josh, how are you guys doing? Good to see you. Good, thank you. Glad uh, to be here. Well, I love to start at the beginning. And so, Michael, we'll start with you. I'd love to hear from both of you how your career started in visual effects. Was it um, your intention to start in visual effects? And if not, how did that door first open? What was the first yes that you said that put you on this path? So, Michael, I know you from you in the same college. So, yeah. you know, back then that you were well I, for this. To give you a little background, I was uh, I, I used to work in the finance area at USC. So, uh, I, that I learned way back then that it wasn't really something that I was really passionate about. So while I was there, I, I met a person who we both know, who uh, uh, a person named uh, Tim Wilcox, who he uh, was working on the first season of Babylon 5. And I started hanging around him and getting to know him. And the more I saw what he did, the more I got interested in, in the visual effects side of things. Uh, I had a little bit of background. Uh, I was a production assistant on a few movies early on, but uh, I never really thought about visual effects as being, uh, you know, the uh, career that it, uh, that it was going to turn out to be. So um, I started hanging around him, and then I got to know him, and then I started making friends with his friends who were all in visual effects, and then I started learning the software and teaching myself on the side. I, I enrolled in a class. Uh, called um, How to Learn Power Animator, uh, 
which was the precursor to Maya, which was the industry standard. And so, um, you know, I got to learn that. And while I was taking this class, I met this other person uh, who was learning it, who worked for Disney. And so we became really good friends. And then he started inviting me to come over to visit him over on the lot on the Disney lot. So I got, you know, I'd go over for lunches and we'd talk and hang out and all that kind of stuff. And then I got to meet his boss. And what happened was eventually his boss asked me if I was interested in maybe, you know, coming over there as an intern. So, you know, at the time I was like, well, yeah, that's, that sounds like a, a you know, a, a good way to, to start. He said, I can't, you know, I couldn't pay you at the time, but, um, you know, what he did is he worked with my schedule. I was, you know, still working in finance at USC. So I would, I would basically work a full day at USC. And then at night when I was done, I would just grab a quick bite to eat. And then I would intern at Disney from say around seven o'clock at night till about two o'clock in the morning. Amazing. Yeah. So I, I did that for about, about four months. And then he saw that I had, he uh, had some talent for what I was doing. So, um, the project I, I was working on, I was doing some internship for James and the giant peach. Okay. And also for a movie called escape from LA. Small little film you might've heard of. Yeah. Yeah. Just a little film. So, um, uh, as I was, uh, as I was starting to do it, he noticed I had the talent for it. So he made me an offer. He said, we have about four months left to this project. And he said, after that, we're closing. He goes, I will hire you if that's what you want. You know, you can be an artist on this. Um, but I can't guarantee you anything after that, you know? So that, that was a, that was a difficult decision for me because it, here I had a, 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 a full-time job that I was, you know, a guaranteed full-time job that I didn't care for versus a job that, you know, I really liked, that I really put a lot of extra effort into, that I was passionate about it. But after three or four months, it was going to go away. So I talked to the friend that originally got me involved in the project, and he said, you know what, you can always find a job that you don't like. You can always do that. He goes, this is the one time, you know, that you can do something that you really like, even if it's for the next four months. So, um, that was my yes moment. I said, okay, let's, let's try this out. Uh, I finished the project and, um, and then at that time, uh, the company that I originally got, uh, the Disney company, their visual effects company was called Buena Vista visual effects. They were being taken over by dream quest, which was another big visual effects company. Disney had bought dream quest. So since they bought dream quest, they didn't need Buena Vista anymore. So what they did is said, well, we have a couple projects over, uh, at dream quest that we would like you to go. One's called uh, con air. Oh my God. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's spiraled really fast. That's so amazing. Next, yeah, so they signed me to a two year contract over at uh, dream quest and, and then you were off. Yeah, uh, after that, I it was. That. Yeah, I went from con air to Georgia, the jungle to mighty Joe young to uh, a little bit of Armageddon. Uh, all these, these big projects in the, in the two years that I was there. Amazing. I love that. I love that story. And there's um, such a journey when it's midstream and you got a job with really good bennies and you have to make that commitment cut and bungee jump off into the unknown. So uh, thanks for sharing that. I know it's going to really uh, uplift some people that are going through similar decisions in their lives. My Josh, pleasure. what's your journey? Oh my, I don't know if I can compare to Michael. Um, Look, as a as a kid, I saw Star Wars, as many of us did, and that's kind of why, you know, the first Star Wars, and that's why a lot of us are in this business. But back then, it wasn't, you know, I grew up in Northern California, 
I went to a local state school, San Jose State, because that's really all my parents and I could afford. And they weren't really teaching visual effects in college back then. Even though Star Wars had obviously come out years before, it wasn't really a thing. It was sort of film and TV production. So certainly going into visual effects was not part of my original career path because it wasn't something that was talked about back then. Um, and then I moved to Los Angeles, not to date myself, but right around the time that Jurassic, the first Jurassic Park came out. And that was kind of this revolutionary moment of, oh my gosh, look at computers, you know, this new wave of going from the old visual effects photographic to suddenly this computer animation. And it was kind of a wake up call to me. And I was like, oh gosh, what am I going to do? And I moved to Los Angeles knowing nobody. A buddy of mine lived here. I'm in Los Angeles currently. A buddy of mine lived here selling Xerox copiers. He let me crash on his couch for two weeks until I could find a place to live and a job. And I just kind of cold called around and I got hired as a production assistant like Michael at a company that no longer exists, a company called VIFX back then. And it was a short term gig and it didn't, I, I was not an artist by trade. Certainly visual effects, you know, Star Wars inspired my love of movies, but not necessarily my love of visual effects. Cause again, it wasn't, didn't seem like a thing back then. Um, and certainly I could not draw, I still can't. I'm not an artist by any stretch of the imagination, but I was always, you know, kind of good at math and a little organized. You can't tell by this room's a little messy right now, but I'm kind of detail oriented. And what I realized at the start of working at this company was if you if you could understand how to package something and manage it, you could follow this process through and be very organized and detail oriented. And it became sort of about schedules and budgets and making sure the artists got what they needed. So there's another avenue to visual effects, like Michael's obviously a very skilled artist. Then there's those of us that are on sort of the production management side where you sort of have a schedule and you have to I yeah, have to get these and this number of artists for this number of weeks and move the shot through its pipeline. And so one thing led to another. I stayed at that company for a few years. They got bought by another and yada, yada, yada. And here I am now at, a, at one of the biggest companies in the world. So I feel very fortunate. But again, visual effects, you know, it's now an industry that is massive and we can't find enough people to fill the seats that we need because there's so much content being created and almost every project needs visual effects in some capacity or another. That's a really great insight. And it's a, uh, I love that you just came to LA and that's so many different people's journey that they just got here. Right. You know, and so when you were both navigating that intern first access PA jobs, those tend to kind of be in production. So, um, is there an internship PA kind of pipeline on shows? How has the business and access changed now from when, say, we were all starting out? You know, is it easier? Is it more difficult? Do you kind of in your evaluation, it has the internet helped accessibility? Can it sometimes it feels like for people that they send their resume to jobs at Warner Brothers and it goes into this really deep space, not really sure if anybody ever saw it. Um, any insights or thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a good question, Michael. What do you think? I mean, a lot of companies and a lot of productions have left Los Angeles, so coming here almost almost isn't as important as it was 20 some odd years ago. I don't know, Michael, what do you think? Um, I, I know from uh, the company I work for at Encore that uh, we've had, uh, we brought on some interns, uh, to give you an example, um, that have, they didn't stay in interns very long. They, they, you know, they brought them on, they showed their worth. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of uh, big companies that actually value having interns. I know I did a Disney, uh, uh, when I was a digital domain, they had an internship program. So they're out there. You just, you have to find them. Um, but, um, to get what I said about the, the interns that we had over at Encore, um, one of them basically started, uh, was a coordinator on, uh, some of the shows that we were working on in our department and now just took a big job as a producer at a different company. So. You know that that's that's one way to do it. You know, I guess it depends also on 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 what it is that you want to do. Um, artist internship may take a little longer, but 
you know, the, the idea is just get your foot in the door, you know, and then you get to know as many people as you possibly can, because it's, it's kind of like a big tree. You know, you start from one spot and then everybody moves around. And then if you know those people, they hear about a job. So then, you know, you go there and then that branches out into a bunch of different other areas because they, we all move around in the same circles. You know, we, we, you know, we all get to know each other because for as big of an industry as it is and as much work as it is, um, the, the artists tend to just kind of shift from one side to the other, so. Yeah, it's a good point. Josh, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, what are the fundamental maybe software that people should, you know, Michael got whatever the hottest software was at that time and taught it to himself, right. access to information online and YouTube tutorials are more prolific than ever. What would be that software if you were looking at say four intern resumes, what well, would pop out at you? It's interesting, right? Michael, I mean, you and I can probably debate the, the who's who's considered the star in visual effects, right? For a long time, it was the animator. And some people might still think that animation is the, the pinnacle, right? That you're animating uh, the Lion King, you're animating Iron Man. But it's funny when you actually look at our pipeline our pipeline is very, I hate to say it's like a factory, but you have to start with roto and prep and match move, and then you can do animation, and then there's lighting somewhere in there, there's effects, and then compositing. And so there's all of those have, Michael, please feel free to jump in, but all of those have sort of different pieces of software often that you can learn and use. And the compositor, I've always thought, was intrinsically more important than the animator because before that shot goes to film or winds up in the cut, the compositor is literally the last person to touch it and has to balance all the elements and make it look good. And so compositing software, a little bit different than sort of effects or animation software, but I was looking at some stuff earlier this week and Mike, I don't know, but there's a Houdini. I always thought Houdini was a great piece of software and I thought it was really expensive. And I just learned there's something called Houdini apprentice, which I think right. people can get for free or for a limited amount of time. And it's, that Houdini software can do, I mean, huge amounts of things. And maybe that's a way to get an entry level thing. If not, you know, learning, what would you suggest for rotoscope and, and compositing? Well, you can, you can, I mean, you, you have to really figure out what part of the, the pipeline you want to be in. That's important because. By the way, I don't know any of these softwares, but I do know Excel. I know Excel and PowerPoint <laughs> because I'm looking at schedules yeah. and FileMaker and tracking of data. You know, I'm not actually, so it's interesting, right? Like I'm aware of the software packages, but I can't use them. Like Michael will explain now what they each do. And I, but my software of choice is either Excel or PowerPoint or something that helps me do budgets and, you know, shotgun, for instance, is another good uh, tracking tool for data. And, and let's not, let's not, uh, let's not downgrade how important those softwares really are. Cause they, they, we can't do what we do without shotgun or, or right. not knowing what, uh, Excel sheets to use and stuff, but uh, on the artist side of it, I would say, um, you know, for, for tracking artists, tracking and layout, I use synthize a lot. Um, I What's learned that called, Michael? synthize. How can you spell it? Uh, uh, it's S Y N T H E S or E Y E synth eyes. Oh, synth I got it. Okay. Thanks. Um, that's a, a tracking software that's that's it's pretty common. There's also 3D Equalizer, which is another one. Uh, it's a, uh, they use that a lot at Weta and and other uh, uh, big companies. Uh, on the 3D side of it, I learned Maya, um, which is kind of the industry standard. Um, I do know a little bit of Houdini. Houdini's been around a long time. They're they're uh, generally in the past, Houdini has been known for its particle effects. And uh, I was a particle artist for about, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. Should we explain what that means to people? Like, I mean, it's water, it's fog, it's atmosphere, it's rain, yeah. it's smoke, it's sparks, it's embers. I mean, it's, yeah, it's it, leaves it's, blowing around. It's, it can do so much. Basically, any element that you, <clears throat> you can create, you know, like you just said, water, fire, wind, uh, Dust. Um, I, I created. Uh, I worked on the Dupes of Hazard movie, and uh, there was a sequence where uh, the General Lee was doing these tail spins in the dirt, and they couldn't generate enough dirt to make it look like a dirt cloud. So 
I actually created the actual smoke of, uh, dirt effect around it to, uh, you know, enhance that. And that happens a lot. I, I, I worked on another project where they needed snow, um, but you can't control the weather. You know, you can't tell it to snow harder or, or whatever. So I had to add more snow falling to a, to a shot or a sequence of shots. So um, that's what, that's what particle effects are. You can create, you know, elemental things, you know, uh, basically. Uh, they're also used for, to, uh, you can generate crowds for them, people. So if you have a big, like, group, like an army, like they did in Lords of the Rings, you can't hire that many people to, to work in a sequence. So you need, you know, to use um, uh, basically a, a software to be able to generate um, crowds through like that. You're so, like like a soccer stadium in Ted Lasso, right? A lot right, of the stadiums right. are empty. Yeah. And that's what's interesting, right? Because there's there's the big visual effects projects you think of, you know, the the Marvel movies, you know, the the Star Wars movies. Yeah, Mandalorian, um, superhero things, action movies like Fast and the Furious, you know, you, you obviously think of stuff like that. And those are the the obvious social dinosaurs in Jurassic World coming out next summer. But <clears throat> there's obviously the invisible effects, I would say, you know, where some random romantic comedy on Netflix may have two, three, four hundred shots because they had a green screen car driving scene or cosmetic fixes because an actor was sick one day, maybe, or the wig didn't work, or you know, like Ted Lasso, a great example. You don't think of Ted Lasso as being a visual effects show, but almost all of those stadiums are visual effects shots because they don't have, as Michael said, they can't hire, you know, twenty five thousand people to fill those stadiums while they're shooting. So this there's a there's a world where there's the stuff you know and there's the stuff you don't know. But my point is it's not the visual effects industry, it's not going away. You know, when you have 400 shots in a non visual effects show, I mean, Michael, wasn't the big statistic that Titanic, the movie had 400 shots, and that was considered a big movie back in 90. Back then. So that's like the first I, episode of Dragons now. Right. That's the first, that's yeah. the prologue of, of the next Marvel movie, right? <laughs> I mean, when they have yeah. 3,000 shots in a movie, 400 is a small sequence now. Yeah. I, I spent a year on Tron Legacy. And that had 1200 effect shots in it. So, you know, Amazing. and I think that opens the door. I mean, um, so I don't know if uh, Caroline, this is a good time, but we're going to share some resources and please remember everybody listening, all of the links and software that we're talking about. Caroline's going to um, collect them all and everybody's going to get an email that has a lot of links and resources, things you can find within the library system and things that you can find online. And um, one of the links Caroline's going to share with us in a little bit today is going to be a bit of an infographic of the workflow that they're referencing and and it, and on this website, they do a, a good job of kind of it's very general. But it's a bit of an overview of what the different departments are called and what some of the jobs within those departments, both on the production side and the artist side. And so that'll give you some visual reference. There it is. Caroline, so you guys can link and follow along as Josh and Michael continue to navigate. One of the things we think about when you think of VFX um, is the obvious big stunt summer movies or big, huge action TV shows. Um, but there's a lot of career and accessibility um, in the cleanup music beauty space. So there's a lot of work that people maybe wouldn't think about that um, is uh, other doors of accessibility as you're starting out. To also look at music video companies and commercial houses, shops that are doing beauty and cleanup, which work a lot more in, there's an actor and they have a blemish on their face and they wanna clean it up before the music video goes up on Vivo. There are entire small shops that just specialize in that. And sometimes it's good um, resume builders. Are there any other areas that people should be thinking about? You guys I mean, can Mark, think- should we talk, We're talking a lot about, you know, a final imagery for for movies and, and episodic. Should we talk about previs or, or gaming because it's very similar pieces of software and skill sets. It's just on a much faster scale or faster time frame, I should say. 
and it's big it's turnaround like, times and production times. The turnaround times are a lot faster. You don't have to get it, per, you know, completely pixel ready f to be on the big screen because no one should see it except for the filmmakers. But you're using a lot of similar animation platform, you know, maybe 3ds Max instead of Maya because it's maybe got a quicker interface. But is there anything yeah. like that that maybe we should focus on? Like instead of looking for a visual effects company, there's also pre visualization companies, right, Michael? Yeah, there's. Um... Uh, the, I worked for the third floor for a little bit. They're the 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 big one at the moment. Sure. Uh, they're they're doing most of the the, the major um, movies right now. A lot of Marvel stuff. Um, I I also worked for a little while for uh, I worked on Day After Tomorrow. I was pre, a previs artist for that. And um, but that was we actually worked for the production company for that. So, you know. Uh, not until probably the last, I want to say, 10 years has it turned into these companies that decided that they were going to go exclusively for previs. Um, so, uh, that, and they're great. They're great companies. All of them. They're just, they're fantastic. Um, but I wonder if Kimberly, like you're saying, the way to get in is not necessarily know a piece of software when you start there, but maybe you just go as a runner, you know, you just go as yeah. a product assistant who's helping guys get lunches or dropping off packages. And then you learn what everybody in that company does and say, oh, that guy's cool because he gets to, you know, sit at home and do some animation versus that guy has to come into the office and do compositing. So it's almost it's like it's okay to not know it. it. Yeah. Yeah, the, the good thing about all the learning stuff nowadays is that, you know, when I started, I had, I had to pay a lot of money for a class to do it because there wasn't very many classes. Now there's like, tons of classes there you have nomen which uh they teach you just about any any school you know any type of software that you want you can learn nuke you can le learn maya you can learn houdini all those different you know packages mm -hmm. plus they go into other things like you know how do you do screenwriting for an animation short or you know a lot of different uh they, yeah, they don't just really teach specific you learning stuff Right. Well, no, yeah. the is good because they're using professionals in the industry to come and teach the classes. It's teach not the classes. Yeah. 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 And what's really exciting about these times, I mean, it's to me, it, it's, I love that we've all gotten to be part of this business over the decades that we haven't gotten to see the change. But for people just starting and getting in right now, there couldn't be a better time in some ways because. When we were coming up, you learned how to do one thing, and that was the thing that you were going to do. And now just being able to like LinkedIn learning, I was really pleasantly surprised to see how much visual effects tutorials that people are sharing on LinkedIn learning, which you can access through the LA library. We, we have LinkedIn learning. And so um, navigating how much visual effects and specialists that are doing really comprehensive tutorials on their accessibility to information and knowledge is so great that there's no longer that financial barrier to entry to right. be able to engage. Um, so it's great when you can go to a great school of animation like UCLA or Chapman or all of these amazing film schools, but that's no longer the only road. I love the fact that some of the best most exciting artists that are coming up and with AR and VR in games um, that's happening, which a lot of us in narrative are moving into these other platforms of narrative storytelling. We're working closer than ever with this side of the fence and a lot of these really exciting out of the box ways of thinking about capturing image and portraying it and interacting with it is coming from people that taught that are really self learned found the right mentors found sh people that were working on stuff they loved and got themselves um opportunities to learn from them so uh, and, and, everything and, you guys are saying really feeds into that yeah and of course uh, you're you're leaving out probably one of the biggest things that's starting to happen in uh in relation to visual effects and that's virtual production um that's starting to be a really big deal um uh, I started learning some of that uh, over the summer when I, I had a little bit of a break, and uh, that's run through Unreal uh, Engine. Yeah. So, and they're making their software very access accessible very to accessible. people. Too. Yeah. So, Unreal Engine is a great organization. You guys can find it. Just Google it. Um, they also are doing an education program at Tribeca where filmmakers can learn how to utilize Unreal 
um, and they're really changing the way that production's happening. Um, so thank you for bringing that up, Michael. I think virtual production, volumetric production. I think COVID times really impacted your industry a lot. And that I think is one of the tentacles that we're gonna see that's gonna be a real game changer that I think was expedited because of COVID dynamics and that so many productions rushed, you know, were way more open to even considering doing this type of virtual production, volumetric production that maybe wouldn't have been as inclined to try something new, but they had to because we couldn't have more than 10 people in a scene. Right. And so uh, talk to us a little bit about those dynamics and how, like how you guys both are learning on the job new stuff. I think that's also, you know, a filmmaker can get a camera and we can shoot something the same way we've been shooting stuff for 75 years. Yeah. But in the yeah. VF business, you guys cannot do that. You're constantly training, self-learning. I find that the visual effects society seems to really be, be more aggressive about creating more opportunities for you guys to learn and then to share your knowledge with others. I find the tone of VFX society has really evolved in that in that way. But also how has COVID changed hiring practices? There's already there's already been a lot of migration for yeah, no, the, the pandemic. Work. Yeah. It's it's an interesting point, Kimberly, because the pandemic not just accelerated maybe the interest in virtual production, which is probably going to happen anyway. It's now faster, but it's probably the the accelerated the fourth and final uh, area of this, Michael, that we haven't talked about, which is a lot of these skill sets are translatable to feature animation or just animation in general. So a Pixar film or you know, Ron's Gone Wrong or Spider-Man into the Spideyverse, a lot of these artists are using the same or similar software packages and doing you know a year or two on an animated film, a year or two on a visual effects film. So I know we're talking about visual effects, but when we talk about it as an industry, those artists and those skills are transferable from in, in a wide variety, you know, previs, virtual production, feature film, episodic visual effects, animated features. So, you know, some of these companies, Michael Wright, are doing both at the same simultaneously. Yeah, I think you have to think of it as you, you have to have a, a toolbox. And in that toolbox, you have to know, like, yeah, you know, you have your hammer, which could be Maya. You could use that anywhere. You could use that at uh, Disney's feature, featured animation. You could use that at uh, Weta. You could use it at any of the big visual effects companies. Uh, you could also use it at any of the game companies because they use it. Uh, they also have their own proprietary software. But the idea is you learn a skill set that's translatable into all these different industries so that you have leeway to go to you know whichever one that you really want. And you know, as much as you know, visual effects has always been related to entertainment and television, but all the skill sets are the same across the board. You know, I know a lot of people that uh, work in the game industry that have gone back and forth between visual effects and the game industry. You know, it depends on what they want to do. You know, which uh, what they feel more comfortable doing. Um, and, and you were talking about the Visual Effects Society. I was um, on the board uh, for the Visual Effects Society for a couple of years and still an active member. And uh, we always try to promote different areas of uh, entertainment. You know, animation, uh, games, um, you know, obviously television and and motion pictures. So there's it, everything kind of crosses over. But getting back to my point about having a, a toolbox, it's good to have, you know, a lot of different uh, knowing different softwares um, and the concepts of how to use them is really important when you talk about visual effects. You know, because um, you can use them in, in different areas. You can use that in previs. You can use that in games. You can use that in animation. You know, the, the concepts are all the same. It's just that what you're using them for is different. That's really insightful. And it's encouraging to know that there's more transmutability from section to section with a certain level of skill set. So, I think some people might feel, oh, I can't draw. Josh, you kind of mentioned you weren't necessarily a fine artist, rocking out big sculptures as a seventh grader. Nope. <laughs> but there are so many um, different ways that we are creative beings that I think 
Uh, what are some of the traits or characteristics that you don't need to draw, but what do you need to be able, what, what strengths does someone need to have to be a visual artist? Once you learn the technical software, there's still an artistry to it. So I would, I would say the biggest answer. Yeah, the biggest answer to that is just to be a problem solver. And it sounds simple and it sounds unspecific, but, but software has gotten so good as you're saying the technical side is. You know, 1 of these software packages can make a photo real explosion all great, but can't, but it can't do a photo real explosion like in the LA County library, because it doesn't know the shape of the library or the lighting in the library. So, yeah, you may be able to press the button and make the explosion, but now you've got a problem solve. How does that explosion fit in this environment? You know, how does it move through? Maybe the director wants it to be like the water thing in the abyss, right? Where it chases you. So it's not just a, a thing of water. It's got to have some artistry to it, <clears throat> which does not mean you need to know how to draw. You need to understand how to problem solve that piece of software and get it to articulate and animate in the way you want it to do. So that sounds like math and computers to me. <laughs> it's a lot of math. I would say it's a lot of math. There's programming, there's engineering. Uh, there's definitely computers, um, but there's also, you know, I know I keep coming back to this. There's also my side of the business where if you watch credits on the movies, you may see the title visual effects producer and just kind of be confused by what that means. But it's basically project management. You know, we get a budget and a schedule at the beginning of a show that says, here's a script and you've got $10 million in a year and you've got to get this done. And so, you know, the pr producer works with a production manager and some coordinators and you hire artists and companies and you have to schedule this thing out and make sure that your director is getting feedback at the right time and your visual effects supervisor. So there's a whole other side of the business that doesn't necessarily have to be as um, technically savvy as the engineering IT programming thing that Michael and I are talking about so much, but it's another crucial part and sort of an undervalued part, in my opinion. We put a lot of emphasis on the creative, which granted at the end of the day, we're seeing pretty pictures and the creative is critical, but in order to make that effective, Properly, I think the production side often gets a short, sh short shift, short shift. Sure. Short. Well, I think people yeah. don't realize how many everyday skill sets and um, call them civilian jobs are really <laughs> translatable to both production and the creative side of this. I find that producers are diplomats. They are. They can talk to different types of people, and more importantly, here different types of people and be able to translate it. I think it's essential because that's kind of the hub of every department and you're, you're, you're the heart literally that keeps all the different limbs engaged on the same path, dealing with each other when they have creative differences and being able to stay on time and on budget. Some of the best producers I know are great because um, they're just really organized people which I think is a character trait we don't all have. And people who are really good at uh, finance, accounting, are really, really successful in this part of the business. They know how to keep the trains running on time and that keeps the studio happy and the money flowing. Um, but yet they can talk to creative entities and creative beings. Yeah, um, that's, I, I think that's important. Also, the important aspect is the, the people aspect is, you know, a, a really, Good producer is relatable. Somebody that, you know, he's that go between or he or she, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Um, between the artists and the client. So, you know, that's a tough job, you know, because, you know, uh, the client wants what they want. They don't care how they get it. They just want it. And, you know, you need a good producer to say, you know, that's possible in that time period or that's not possible in that time period or you're asking a lot, you may have to dial it down a little bit because that's you know creative. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's not in our budget. We don't have the infrastructure for that. You know, there's a, a lot, you know, a good producer knows what they have and they're able to relate to the artist side of it and then turn around and relate to the client side of it. So that's it's a it's definitely a juggling act there. So and not to be too pedantic, but I remember having to explain to my family what a visual effects producer did because all my family knew was it's the movie business. There's a director and a producer and an actor. That's all they thought the three jobs were. But right. the way to explain it that I always helped them was with the visual effects producer, 
works with the visual effects supervisor in the same way that the producer of the movie works with the director of the movie. So the director of the movie says, I want to shoot in a football stadium and the producer goes and finds a football stadium and hires the right people to do it. Whereas the supervisor says on in visual effects, like I need to animate a, you know, a lion to do something. And the producer says, great, I will help you go find the company and the people to do that. So it's the, it's the budget and schedule side that helps the creative and technical side. And there's this whole creative problem solving that Mike was pointing out. Like some people have big appetites, but may not be able to, you know, afford it because of time or money. And so creatively you have to solve this problem. Like, okay, maybe if we, this shot was shorter or this was a different angle, or we, you know, we didn't demand every third cut was this. So there's creative problem solving. And I, I come back to that. If you're not technical or artist minded, you know, like I certainly was not. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. What are some of the other characteristics, Michael, when you're putting a team together or you've had teams in the different parts of the workflow that have been really successful? What are the characteristics of artists? Things change a lot. Um, people can't be territorial about their work. Um, what are some of the other kind of patients? I think I always love working with VX people that are patient and don't roll their eyes while I'm in the room when I have to come and make a change <laughs> order. They wait till I leave and they're like, oh my God. Um, what other dynamics do you feel really? People are wondering, could I be good at that? What are characteristics that could lend themselves to being a really good artist? Uh, something that I learned early on, um, you don't really fall in love with the work that you do. You have to remember it's a uh, client driven art. So you're trying to satisfy their needs, whether you like what you're doing or not. So like, I, I know there's been like in the past, um, like uh, an artist will do something and they're really proud of it and they like it. And then they submit it to a client and the client's like, nope, don't like it, <laughs> that's not what I want. And then they'll push them in a different direction. And some some artists don't like that because they're like, you know, it's great, what's wrong with it, you know? Isn't it? You can't take it personally in this business. Yeah, you, you gotta remember, you have, you have to please the client. You, the idea is to get them what they need because you're trying to satisfy a vision of somebody else's vision, basically. You know. I also like to think about not just the client, but serving the story and the character. And sometimes everything on paper and in the script sounded fantastic. But when we really start voicing it, and we really start getting the, mo the movements. The story's just not coming out the way as a storyteller, we intended it. And sometimes we have to serve the character and the narrative and things need to change. And it's so hard when you're doing a show that's VFX heavy, when so much work has been done. It's not like I've got 12 takes or something, I can just switch it in the edit. So yeah. that's something I, the people that I love working with in effects have, have a really um, great understanding about that part of the yeah. dynamic that it's not personal. Yeah, and uh, the, the one of the, the, the things that's always, uh, the the greatest thing is like when you work on a shot and you've worked on it forever and it's a difficult shot and you put a lot of hours into it and everything. And then, you know, you get to the point where you think, okay, I'm done with it. And then all of a sudden you turn around and the shot's been emitted from the, you know, it's gone. It Sequence just, cut. Yeah. All that extra work that you just put in there, you thought, oh, you know, this is going to be great. I can't wait. I can use that. Oh, nope. That shot went away. It's gone. Yeah. You know? That that happens, you know, happens all the time. So I love when people are thinking about well, which part of this business should I gear myself towards really knowing who you are and getting to know what you want your day to be like. These are things to think about as you're pursuing the different opportunities to learn. Or, or they're uh, important to realize that you got to know what your strengths are, you know, I don't know so, what your strengths are. Some people are are fantastic at, at talking to other people and making connections and they're good salespeople and they're, you know, that's their good strength. People. Right. Good at pitching ideas, good at pitching the directors right, solutions right. for their script. It's a really great identification. 
Yeah, but there's, you know, especially in the artist community, there's artists that they don't relate as well to people as they do to, you know, software or to, you know, yeah. artistic things, you know, they would prefer to do that. And that's, that's where they, they thrive. That's, but that's awesome. You need both of them, you know, there's, there's a place for someone if that's what you want to do, you just have to find where your place is, you know, get in where you fit in. So. So the things that we do and the steps that we can take to to make those connections and find those things out about ourselves, I think it's really important that we're, we're I love to try to choose the people that I learn from, right? And every creative opportunity, I've tried to say yes to jobs where I was going to be learning from someone that I really felt they created great stuff. Um, some of my most impactful mentors where people I didn't even know existed or what their job title was. And by the end of working on that show, it changed my life and changed my ability. And then it made me really clear about being really, like I had the right to learn from good people. If I was in a situation where people didn't seem like they were doing it right, where people weren't maybe treating me in a, at least a respectful way, because being an intern, being an apprentice, can be really, really tough, long hours, low pay, but there's still some boundaries in terms of healthy, creative learning environments. What were the tools of the people or what was what you remember about the people that you got to learn from early on that really gave you the confidence that this was a, the world in the path for you? What were the characteristics of the people that you were like, I learned so much from that situation or that person. Yeah, there was there was definitely, you know, key people, I guess you, you're referring to mentors, you know, probably not necessarily for me apprentice, but one of the key pieces of advice I remember getting was do more than you're paid to do and eventually you'll be paid to do that. And it was an interesting concept of that. Yeah, you 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 know, like yes, I'm only here to drop off mail or I'm only here to pick up lunches, but if I learn this piece of software or if I learn how to do that, then Yes, I may not be paid right now, but eventually the concept being you'll get promoted, right? And you'll you eventually get paid to do that job. And people that encourage that and didn't, you know, I don't seem I don't think most people I, luckily did not discourage that, but I guess there's people that recognize it versus those that don't recognize it. And that's that's the difference. When you find somebody that recognizes the extra work you're putting in, that's that's key. Most people won't discourage it, but it's finding those who recognize it. That's a really good point. And, and I think, Michael, what you said about making sure that you're trying different things, and Josh, I think you mentioned work somewhere that does a good part of the workflow so that you can see what different things are to see what you gravitate towards. I think that's really important to not kind of get stuck with one, like one piece of the pie that you're only getting that exposure. I do think it's important for people to think about the different approaches. Getting a job at a really big shop, the bigger the shop, the more people tend to do their one job, right? Whereas sometimes if you're working at smaller shops, more boutique shops or freelancing, you're working with people that do a lot more of the workflow. You have a better chance to touch more things and learn more things because at a big shop, you're the background artist, you're the background artist, and you do backgrounds. <laughs> if you're the prop person, you're the prop person, you do props. But at smaller shops, they cover more territory. So in some situations, you'll have the opportunity to get your hands on learning more stations. Can you give me your thoughts on that approach? And then I want that to lead into us talking about working at a big shop versus the freelance life and your thoughts on both of those. But let's talk about just when people are looking for their first internships or their first entry level jobs, do you have any thoughts about going for a big studio versus a smaller boutique house where you might have to work harder, but you learn more? Uh, I can give you a little background into my situation. Um, when I started, there was there wasn't a lot of compartmentalizing of of jobs, you know. Um, when I worked on Con Air, I not only did I do my own tracking, I did my own animation, I did my own rendering and lighting. I did I basically followed it all the way up to comp and then comp took it over from there. 
And, uh, and let me tell you the value of a good comp artist. I mean, those guys can save your lives. They really can. But, um, and, and um, back then that was a big company. Um, there wasn't so much of this, you know, you do one thing, whatever, but then eventually I kind of transitioned over to picking one, one discipline. Um, I ended because you loved it. You felt like you were really strong at it. Can you give us an insight as to why? Uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one was, um, the industry changed to the point where it's like, they prefer having specialists, specialists. Mm -hmm. um, to do stuff. Um, now, um, I'm good at some things and I'm not good at others. That's, that's anybody, right? Um, I may be better at animation, but not as good at rendering and lighting. You know, I'm not as good as doing, sh you know, shaders or, or texture mapping as opposed to particles. I mean, you know, if at the smaller boutiques now, you're going to be required to do a lot more of everything, you know, because they don't have the budget to hire 200, 300 people, you know, so they're looking for generous generalists um which is a good thing i mean it's good to know the whole pipeline from beginning to end you know uh, and it makes you more resourceful to be able to shift gears if you need to um in a big company you get to know your craft really really well because you do it every single day you know that's your craft you're you know if you're a matte painter that's what you do but the thing is uh I know it sounds kind of, that can sound kind of mundane, like you're doing the same thing over and over, but it's not because the projects change and what you're asked to do is always different. You know, you may, you know, need to, to, you know, create a monster in one project, you know, a creature like a dinosaur or something like that in one project. And then another, you may be doing more of an Android or a human being or, you know, something like that. So. You may be doing the same job, but the actual task is a little different. Yeah, so, Pikachu's a bit different than Godzilla, for instance. But yeah, it's still, exactly. it's still animation, right? Right. Yeah, and you know, and again, it goes back to the whole thing. You know, the the techniques are all the same, and you get to know them really well. But it's just that which you know, the every project's different. You know, every every project you work on is is always going to be a little different. So. That's where the, the variety comes in. And there's a bit of a ladder element that we're, we're sort of skipping over because I know we're talking about getting into the business, but <clears throat> as Michael's saying, if you're a compositor for a number of years, you can eventually become a compositing supervisor. Whereas, you know, same thing if you're in animation, you know, you, you become like an animation supervisor, then maybe you're the head of a department. If you're at a big company, you can become a 2D supervisor, a 3D supervisor, and eventually the visual effects supervisor, you know, of a movie. And you might start with a small movie because maybe it's your first one before you graduate to doing something at the scale of Dune. But being a generalist, as Michael was talking about, or a jack of all trades is also can be very appealing to people at smaller companies. But I think one of the skill sets we've ignored, not intentionally, is having a bit of a photographic background. And I'm not saying you have to have a camera and take amazing black and white photographs, but understanding the difference between a 35 millimeter lens and a hundred millimeter lens and how the defocus works and how that changes composition. I mean, the, the compositor who's the last person, as we talked about in this, in this pipeline usually has to know how defocused something is, if it's in the foreground, background or midground. And I think if you understand a bit of filmmaking techniques and a bit of photography, that can actually really enhance your visual effects skills as well. That's great. That's a great tip. I love that. Yeah, uh, I was I was going to make a, a, I had that on my mind earlier. And I forgot. Thank you for reminding me on that one, Josh. But uh, something that I always tell people um, for as uh, for as much as it's it's really exciting to do the three D work and all that art artist work. I always think of myself as a filmmaker first. You know, I I watch a lot of you know movies and television shows and stuff. And I look at technique and lighting and storytelling and that's all part of it. You know, you were, you, you were mentioning earlier, you know, about, you know, about people, uh, you know, where, what you can do. One of the best things you can do or learn is, is 
to have a photographic eye like he was talking about. Um, you, you have to have the eye for, especially in visual effects, to see what's good and what's not, what works and what doesn't. If you don't have that eye, then it, it's a little harder. But um, that's what kind of makes, you know, long term, uh, the sticking point of you, you know, staying in the industry. So, but it, it also, if you understand storytelling, like to back to Kimberly's point, right? If you understand storytelling from a filmic standpoint, there's enough books and things published nowadays that have storyboards versus compared to, you know, final frames, whether it's like Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is obviously one of the pinnacles or something else. If you understand what an over the shoulder shot is versus a close up versus a two shot, yeah. you understand how to tell a story. And now, if you're the previs artist who's the, initially at that stage, you can crank through a lot of iterations very quickly and, and get approvals a lot faster and move on to the next. There's a couple <clears throat> different job lanes that I think work really well if you are great at story, but not necessarily a particularly you know visual person but if or, you're or a technical person if you understand filmmaking you can still be in visual effects and not have to get into the programming right i love the way that this community is evolving and growing i think part of it's been because there's so many new categories and ar and vr is pushing us the way that 3d took everything and you know shook it upside down um, and more people are coming to this part of the business. So I think it's important, especially for a lot of the different mm, evolution of the type of stories and characters that are getting made now, having artists that all come from different backgrounds, different walks of life, different stations in life. I also find it to be a really um, embracing community that kind of doesn't care what your background was or what your family situation was or if you graduate at high school or got a GED, your life story and things you've been through actually make you a more interesting artist and you can lend more to what's on the screen and you have more life experience to be like, that street wouldn't look like that. Or, you know, people that skydive bring a certain element of knowledge base, right? In their lives. And so can you talk a bit about just how you've seen that change in it? I think it's way more hospitable to women. Um, I think there's more of this language that's coming in that's not a big deal anymore. But I think it's really important to, that people that might be listening know that this is a way more diverse community than it might seem when you're watching like an award ceremony on television. Well, certainly at a company like DNEG where I am now, we are a worldwide company in, Five countries. So, I mean, it's not just, I mean, 20 years ago, you had you know, 25 years ago, whatever, to age myself, you had to come to Los Angeles. Now, with offices, you know, we're Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, London, you know, obviously outside of DNEG, if you want to work in New Zealand or Australia, you know, we obviously have offices in India. I mean, you can still work in America, New York, Los Angeles. So, I think there's so many opportunities now where you're not so locale specific, right? You can be anywhere. And certainly, the, even, Crazier the last two years of the pandemic, you know, a lot of people that that if you initially wanted to work on Lord of the Rings, you had to go to New Zealand, right? Now you right, can almost you sit in Col yeah, yeah, you can almost sit in Colorado and still work for Weta, right? It's sort of this weird pandemic has changed things. And we're all still trying to work that out, understand what work from home means. But I do think having a worldwide entities, I mean, there's ones in Scotland, there's ones in France. I mean, it's 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 the opportunities now are so much greater. And like, as we said at the beginning content, because we now have so many content creators from Apple to Hulu to Amazon to Netflix, in addition to the studios, we in the visual effects industry cannot find enough people to fill, I hate to say butts in the seats, but we really need rotoscope artists, compositors, effects artists, animators. I mean, it is a great time to get into the industry right now. I mean, and it'll, it, look, it'll stay this way in my opinion for the next two or three years. I mean, Michael, don't you think? I don't think content's going away. Uh, I get hit up for work all the time. Uh, but but I, I've um, I've been in my company for a while now and I, I like it, I really enjoy it. So, but yeah, there's, you're always seeing people looking for artists, artists, you know, in, in whatever discipline that you're decide to go into. Um, and, and it is getting, yeah, there's a lot more work out there because before it was, you were, you were trying to go to the, the big studios, uh, for work. 
but it's coming out of the walls now. It's coming from everywhere. It's coming from, you know, Netflix has is, is kind of changed the game a little bit. Um, Just because of the magnitude of how many shows they have in production? The volume. Yeah, the volume. yeah, because, you know, and uh, I mean, more so that, you know, they went out and bought their own visual effects company. So, um, and so, and there's so much more production happening, you know, with Oklahoma, Minnesota having new tax incentives, obviously Atlanta now being a big TV hub, Kentucky, New Orleans has been in the game a long time. Netflix opening up a whole city in New Mexico. Um, are a lot are more production companies bringing effects in house or having local companies. Talk a little bit more about you don't have to live in LA or New York anymore to have a great job in visual effects. Are are there areas, town, regions that people can work from home more or local shops? What what kind what's happening in the business on that side? Um well it, it's uh as Josh was saying, it's changed since the pandemic. Um you don't even have to be in those cities anymore to work because since everything has gone remote, you could, you know, you could be just about anywhere as long as the company agrees to it. System. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we do a lot of work, uh, or, you know, we just, it's become a, a remote society now, you know, that, you know, if you, if you have a good enough connection at home and a, a strong enough workstation that you could just work from home or, you know, I, I've, I've seen artists lately, they've, they've moved out of the state, you know, they're not even here anymore, but they're still working, you know, and they're still busy. So it could be that, you know, even being in New Mexico or Atlanta, which is a hot spot. I mean, I, I think a lot of it depends also on what you want to do. If you need to be on set, you're probably going to have to go to those areas. That's true. Anyway, right? Wherever anybody's shooting. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But, you know, they shoot, uh, they shoot everywhere now. I mean, even in Los Angeles, they're looking for more uh, soundstage space. Um, they just sold um, um, the uh, that little studio over in the, uh, uh, Studio City, the uh, CBS. Yes, yeah, CBS just got sold, and the old Sears compound on Santa Monica Boulevard and Wilton's being turned into a massive new sound stages as well. It's yeah. exploding. But again, yeah. I, I I love the idea that this creates more accessibility for people that don't live in these big cities that could find and really grow resume building opportunities with whatever town you might be listening to us from. Right, right. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, you were mentioning the visual effects society. I was pretty active with them for a long time. And, um, you know, like they do a lot of their, their meetings remote now and they, they do stuff, you know, like I was That's on the public, do They do events that are public facing that anybody they, could participate in. Well, but they, they, they have like chapters all over the globe now. So right. each chapter they do their own functions and stuff like that. But, you know, I was a part of the awards committee for, for years and they, they have members that are in New Zealand that help out in the awards now. So they just remote everything, you know, from, yeah. I mean, it kind of sucks getting up at like 2 AM in the morning to, to do a meeting, but. Get a meeting. Yeah, I think I, we're all getting used to that now. So, Josh, you've been at Legendary for so long. So, when yeah, I was at Legendary for four years. Yeah, you know, just recently left. Um, but you, going back to, we had a great intern program, uh, and I will, I will credit Legendary for being very proactive about that. I want to say it was every quarter, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Um, we had different departments. This is we. You touched on internships and how you learned stuff before, and I forgot to bring this up, but. Like the finance department can get an intern, the production department can an intern, host can, visual effects can, and what creative, you know, obviously I'm skipping creative, one of the most important parts of the company, uh, but everyone gets an intern. And then what we did is throughout their, I guess it was 12 week internship, if I'm not mistaken, <clears throat> they would get a chance to go to, even though they were interning for a certain department, they could go and sit with the heads of departments of the other internships, or they would all gather maybe in the theater. And the head of production would come in and talk to all the interns at one time. So 
you just being in that space, even if it may not be a department you're eventually interested in, you still yeah. can see what everyone's doing. Like, oh, here's what the creative guys do. And here's how they talk to production, who talks to finance, who talks to post and effects. So that internship program was super, super valuable. And I know a lot of people did get hired out of that when they finished school eventually, right? Because a lot of those people are doing it while they're still enrolled. I love that. And I love that. Um, I want people to be encouraged. It can seem sometimes like there's so many people all applying for limited internships and you do kind of have to keep the hustle. But as you can hear, both Josh and Michael have both expressed how personal relationships part of the dynamic of how their careers launched and grew. And it's really important. We have such amazing social media tools that there is no excuse to not slide into the DMs of people that are making stuff that you love or that inspires you and reach out and see if you can get an hour Zoom with someone or ask them if their company is accepting interns. I came up through a time where apprenticeships were really important. And um, in the visual effects space, it's not necessarily a lot of companies that have that concept, but I believe we can create our own apprenticeships by identifying the people you wanna learn from. When you get an opportunity, really study the mentality, the personality and the work ethic of who's at that company and find ways to engage with them and get that. You can create your own little mini apprenticeships to learn what that person. And if you ask questions the right way and understand how to read the room and know when the right time is to ask a question, creating your own um, apprenticeship or shadow is a really great way to learn and to help you understand what you're going to be great at. And the more that people recognize you working really hard to learn, they're going to honor it. I don't know any time that anybody's not reached out to me. And when I've seen that they're really passionate, really committed, I might not have a lot of time to give, but I'm, my heart opens and gives it because I will always remember Miriam Jacobs, who saw me one day in a different way. I've been in the office every day, but she found out something that I had gone the extra mile to get something done and something clicked in her. And every day she spent a significant amount of time teaching me stuff. She taught me how to put the production book together. She taught me how to do like everything I needed to know to become a line producer. She taught me the basics. And I was still like running around with a car that barely worked, going to classes at USC and didn't know, I didn't know what I didn't even know yet. And she spent six months teaching me everything I needed to know. And I've been able to work consistently ever since then. Who knows when anybody would have stopped and taking the time to teach me how to do the production book or no, what needed to go into a, the budget. You probably became a better worker because you were working for somebody whose job you wanted. Or, you know, yeah. like it's, I've always found that some of my crew, the best crew are those who are like, oh yeah, someday I would like to be a visual effects producer or whatever yeah. that job title was. And those people work harder, you know? And so you, you we usually we recognize that and respect that and try and teach them yeah. more. Because you, you want to train up the next it. crew. Just follow me when I see somebody that's got that. I'm like, just follow me. Just be with me. Stay on my hip. And that's not because I'm the, I want an assistant. It's because I want to teach them. And a lot of that is watching and doing and seeing how they deal with solving problems. How we come up with creative solutions to something that somebody's written on a page. And that and I love it when somebody from the effects department creates an element. Because I had it a certain way in my mind of how it needed to be. And then the ability to interpret our words into something I would could never have even imagined and it being the magic exactly what the film needed. That's the best part of working with visual effects. You're not limited by the financial restrictions of what we can shoot in real life. This is where all movie magic can happen. And it's such a magical place. And I think it's takes a really magical spirit to be really good at it. You know, yeah, anything it's, it's possible got the limit, right? Your, your your imagination is the limit. Yeah. yeah, that's what's cool about it. And there's always ways that things don't have to be a gazillion dollars in 3D, you know, 12 minute 3D money sequences. Don't need to make something special. You can do it. There's so many tools now that you guys have it's great creative that that makes magical moments. So yeah, I use think that it's mind. Really to VFX. 
Say it again, Michael. Yeah, I said you you definitely use your mind, use your imagination. Those are your those are your real tools. Is that you know how you look at things, how you see things. Uh, that you know, that's what being the filmmaker is. You know, you know that's that's why I you know why I got into it is is that I I have a vivid imagination. I still you know collect comics with my kids and stuff like that. So you know, that's that's what really drives you to want to do it every single day because you, you like that kind of stuff, you know? So. Well, you guys have been working on um, some, some real groundbreaking shows that have done things in really groundbreaking ways and things that people have just been waiting a long time to see. So Josh, congrats on Dune. What's it like with it coming out? How are you feeling about the finished product? That's, no, that's look, what it like to see. To, to leave. Yeah, no, legendary. We're super proud of that movie. It obviously so bummed that the pandemic delayed it by a year, but glad that it's finally come out and everyone's being able to see it. And I think one of the best comments Chris Nolan gave a few weeks ago is it's the seamless blend of live action filmmaking and visual effects that he's ever seen. And I think coming from an esteemed director like that, it says it's it's it says you know it says so much. That yeah. somebody like that recognizes that it's it's treated properly, it's respected. It's actually meant to in, increase and enhance the storytelling. It's not meant to di distract from the storytelling. And we even found that when we did the three D version of the film, the stereo, we did the stereo conversion of it. The filmmaker was very conscious and recognized this fact that when there were interiors, the three D was meant to be a little claustrophobic, right? Because what you're worried about Paul and his bedroom and his dreams. And so you didn't want to, this space there. And so the, the three was very compressed. Whereas we get out into the desert scenes and it was like, show this immense scope because everyone's isolated and, and alone. So again, not just visual effects, but stereo enhanced the storytelling in that particular instance. You know, it wasn't just a sales gimmick. It actually looks beautiful. And the film was designed to be seen on an IMAX theater and it's, it's stunning. It's just, it's beautiful. So. Thank you and knock on wood that there's an Oscar nomination for that coming because Paul yeah. Lambert, our effects supervisor, very talented gentleman. Amazing. I'm hoping um, that it comes back to Chinese IMAX because I really, really want to see it IMAX. Um, uh, it wasn't, I wasn't quite going into theaters yet when it was right. over there, but hopefully during award season, it'll come back around to my neighborhood. Michael, you have so many shows on television. What's the latest? What's coming up? that people can watch and stuff that you're really excited about or things that you guys are doing differently that nobody's done before. What's coming up that's going to be airing that you're really proud of? Uh, most of my work lately has been on uh, SEAL Team, which is CBS. Uh, I've been on that for all five seasons. It's that's been incredible. out. It's such a yeah. fun show. Yeah. Um, what else? Um, we're, we're, we're kind of in the process of, of working on a, a number. We're, we get a lot of different stuff. So, um, so COVID probably really impacted where you guys had to do a lot more of the elements because of COVID. How did it change production on SEAL team? And how did you guys have to expand your, what you were working on? Um, it, it didn't change too much. It was just a matter of, you know, they just had to figure out a way to get in there and shoot it. So the restrictions got tighter, you know, um, and, and we didn't get as much of it as, you know, like, like, I'll give you an example. We were, I was working on flash last season, the flash mm -hmm. CW. Um, and they, we were halfway through the season and then the, the pandemic hit. So, you know, everything got abruptly halted. So they, they, shifted everything to just you know like josh was saying it got everything got delayed and pushed back and all that kind of stuff so that was that was the only real mm -hmm. you know, thing about it but um yeah but i can't say too much about what i'm working because they they don't they don't want all the stuff whatever is coming out on broadcast we can focus on what's going to be right. airing in january that we can look forward to seeing your hand uh, and I'm not sure when it's coming out, so that's why I can't okay. really say too much about Got it. it. We'll keep an eye out. Yeah. And I, I love as we start to kind of wrap this up. When you know, where do you find new talent? Where do you or your companies look for 
do resumes or people posting their reels? Do you look at Vimeo? Where are some, some places that you guys are actually hiring people from? Look, the YouTube or Vimeo is a huge, it's a huge job resource. I mean, we, we, you may think it's something silly that just kids do, but you see people using, creating great imagery and you're like, how did they do that? And maybe I can get their permission to, you know, use that here. And you suddenly realize, oh no, they're 14 years old and they have to get their parents to sign a waiver. So you can like, there's no, there's no, like you're saying, it just democratizes everything because you don't know if this, you know, person's experience, not experience. And, it's that showing your work is amazing. Um, obviously, we have, you know, DNA's got a website, uh, obviously, with an HR department, and I'm certainly Caroline can send that out. So we look at resumes, we do um, job markets in certain you know, cities where we already have offices, but we obviously need to expand our horizons because, like, like we're saying, it is a, there is a huge demand. I mean, Michael's getting pinged, as he said, multiple times a week for other opportunities. So we are definitely looking for as many people, whether experienced or inexperienced, that we can train up as we are. I mean, it's it's critical right now in time in our industry. And Michael, for people who, uh, you know, how do how does television, how do television shows hire FX? Are, are there in-house? Are they using shops? How do people who maybe are interested in working on episodic VFX find opportunity? They're, they usually go through houses. Uh, they, you know. does episodic. We, we do have an episodic yeah. department. <laughs> we do features, yeah. we do animated features, we do episodic. Great. Yeah, because it used to be that, you know, you do, you know, one house would do just basically features, but that's not. It's changing. Case, you know. Yeah, it's now it's like, it's whatever project that they pay to do. That's what's available, you know. Well, the quality level, right, Michael? I mean, the quality level, I mean, t TV 10 years ago, Different than it is today, and we're, that's why yeah. I think a lot of us have gotten away from I calling it TV. That. And right, we now call it episodic because Game of Thrones started this whole revolution. Obviously, Sopranos from the storytelling before that, but now the quality. I mean, look at Foundation on Apple. Look at, I mean, yeah, any yeah. of these shows that you're talking about, even all half those CW superhero half shows. Half the stuff on Sci Fi Channel is yeah. remarkable, and Star Trek still keeps rocking and rolling and doing really cool visual moments as well. Um, I also want to encourage everybody, um, for many of you, you might not know what IMDb is. And when you're watching shows, you're watching movies where the effects look really cool, learn who the people are that are making the effects happen. And you look can do that online on IMDb. Start yeah. with yeah. looking at Josh's credits, looking at Michael's credits, and then look up the shows that you really love and learn the names of the people that are working on them. And then you might run across them on Instagram and Twitter or Facebook, reach out, ask one question. Don't send us two pages of stuff. Right. Send even LinkedIn. I'm always open to ask a question or a 10 minute Zoom. You never know. One person might say yes, that could change the trajectory of your journey. So I wanna encourage you guys to use these resources. Obviously the library is a great place to start um, and the LinkedIn learning and figuring out the next steps that you can take to your VFX career. There's, so as we wrap it up, are there some thoughts that you want to share? Kind of some parting gifts? Yeah, I, I wanted I wanted to mention something that uh I know we had talked about doing internships and stuff like that, but yeah. Uh, there's a lot of organizations that are related to the industry that you want to get into that, you know, people are involved in. like we were talking about the Visual Effects Society. You know, um, can you recommend a couple of others? Um, or if you think about them, email them to us and we'll add them to the library resource list. We're going to send to everybody. Right. But any of those professional organizations, you know, for visual effects. Yeah. Or for visual effects, or even just for, you know, like the uh, movie making in general. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to be specific towards visual effects to have some crossover and stuff like that. So, and there's, you know, there's guilds for, uh, I think, um, Previs has their own uh, guild, you know, there's- and There's a little bit of crossover with the animation guild as well, and the animation yeah. union, which is a little unusual because part of animation is covered by union, part it's not, yeah. but there's a little bit of crossover where, where it seems to be supportive of similar, the Venn diagram is growing there. 
but and the art directors guild, you know, for those who are artistically minded, you know, there is a whole concept art you know, thing that we've skipped over, which is, you know, painting and whatever you want to say, Photoshop, whatever. Illustration. But, right. Yeah. So illustration art directors guild, obviously very controlling of those Great people. Point. So another yeah. good aspect. But That's I, I've, I've, I've seen like, uh, I, I don't know how this has changed for the pandemic, but with, uh, you know, the, the VES used to do, uh, their nomination event and we used to hire volunteers to help work the event. And what ended up happening? That's happened, a great way to get in. Yeah, and and what happened is a, a few of those people that got to involved and in, and to know people inside the VES. Yeah. I mean, those those are all visual effects supervisors and producers and artists yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And now this this person that I know, she's she's doing these Zoom, Zoom calls as a producer. You know, that's how she started. So. I love it. And I also want you guys to look at, um, there are festivals out there that do celebrate visual effects films. A lot of animation film festivals will have right. special um, sections that really focuses on visual effects. It's a great way to get to know how to make your own first kind of pieces to show what you can do. Um, there's a lot of online resources that celebrate films, like even Stash Magazine. It's a lot of really um, um, an omelet our websites that I think really show beautifully crafted things that have a lot of FX and animated elements to them. It's a great way to kind of learn who's out there and give you some sensibility about how your first couple of pieces, see building your reel um, that can inspire you. Josh, thoughts? Look, I, I like what you said a while back that the production department, you know, of which I have always been a member to a degree is sort of the, the, the bleeding, the, the hearts, right? Of, of all the artists. So we're, we're talking to the filmmakers. We're talking to the compositor, the animator. What's important to me, I think is, and it's not necessarily. A, a pointer for how to get started in the industry, but 1 of the skill sets that we didn't talk about is. What's critical in our industry is specificity. And mm -hmm. the more specific you can be, and that's what I've tried to train my crew, which is. Be specific, you know, if the, if the, if they want it red, how much more red, if they want it faster, how much faster. If somebody says, move this bush to the right, how far to the right? Like the more specific we can be, I think even Michael would agree the faster we get to the final product, right? The faster, the less iterations you can have and the faster you can. Get a final image up on the screen. I love that. So, um. One of the things I also wanted to give as a tip is, and you guys, I would love for you to pipe in, is um, what to look for. There are a lot of resources, whether you're in Southern California or online resources of where you can learn and train, whether it's self-learning online and finding tutorials, or there's a lot of local schools from LACC to Pasadena, Santa Monica, USC and UCLA both have fantastic visual effects. Um, um, so there are different levels, different um, economic requirements for those, but I do want to, you know, really take a look at what those programs are offering, because there are programs out there that are really, really expensive, but don't necessarily teach you what you need to know. They're not necessarily um, legit. So I want to make sure before you guys are finding random places online, we want to encourage you to look at the list from, say, the Visual Effects Society's um, list. And if you are thinking about a program that you found online, make sure and find somebody that went there and get their recommendation of how their experience was. We want to make sure that you're not signing up for groups that really aren't legit. And we want to make sure that you're coming out with your training that um, you're getting your money's worth and that you really have what you need to take your next step in working on our shows. Any other thoughts in that arena? I think Michael mentioned Noman earlier in the call. Noman's a great school. I think they're based here in Los Angeles. But also the one thing you touched on, Kimberly, that I think we breezed over too fast is how Epic opens up Unreal Engine. And Unreal Engine is a piece of software that they they will help train you. You know, they will they, it's almost it's like open source, but they will help you learn that. And that even just being able to move a camera around can help you understand storytelling. Mm, I love that. There's also a studio art. I think that's also here in Los Angeles. I actually took a couple of courses with them. I took uh, an Unreal Engine course or two of them and learned some uh, game development. That was all virtual? I'm sorry? That was all virtual? 
Uh, the first time it was in person. The second time it was all virtual. Amazing. Uh, I also took a, um, a a VR class there to learn how to shoot VR production. So that was in person, but they're offering they were offering a lot of their courses online. You know, doing uh, via Zoom call, uh, and they they have all sorts of all sorts of of classes. You can learn. Photoshop and storyboard, you know, they have a storyboard class. They have new classes. They got, you know, all sorts of stuff. And I've, I, and our company uh, really encourages us to keep learning. So they, they were actually willing to pay for them, but, you know, some of them are, are you know, uh, relatively, you know, affordable. So. Hey, can you say the name of the school one more time, Michael, that you referenced? Yeah, it's called studio arts. Studio arts. Awesome. So we'll make sure and wrap that into, um, we'll find that link for you guys and, and put it into the reference guide. I'll send a couple links to Caroline as well. So we'll that would be it. great. Thank you so much. And um, can't thank you enough for sharing this part of the journey. I know a lot of times you're asked to talk about your work and the stuff you're working on, but giving us an insight of what your personal journey is, is actually so encouraging and helpful for people. So thanks for kind of um, telling us a little bit more about your history and and um, it's just been a really, really incredible insight that you go, you both have given amazing, amazing thoughts and tips that I'm just like, oh, wait, I've got to take a note of that. And, and remember that the best, the best advice I can give you is that if you really want to do it, be persistent, you know, mm. just stick with it. Don't give up. Yeah. If, if you may get knocked down a few times here and there, but just, you know what, you'll find that window to get yourself in and, and. And once you're in, you'll, you'll love it. So. Amazing. Yeah, we, all, we all got knocked down, but we all got yeah. back up again. Yeah. yeah. Shows get shut down before you're ready. Or your boss gets after, fired and you're your out on your butt. Gets fired and everybody gets let go before you thought it was going to happen. Right. Shows that you worked on that you thought were going to be great end up not being very good. Um, all kind of different things happen. And those is where I feel like I learned the most and I grew the most as an artist. Yeah, and it, it can be and it can be scary when that stuff happens, but you know, you, you got to keep the confidence in yourself that you know that you're you're going to be fine and you just keep at it and you know, I I kept telling myself, you know, all I, you know, if I can make it for, for you know, 5 years, I think I I'll, I'll make a a living out of this and that was what 26 years ago. So. Something, something years ago. Right, yeah. right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so much. Um, so grateful. So, again, thanks for tuning in, everybody. It's so great that you're visiting us week to week. I hope you got a lot out of this. Um, you can find me at Hollywood Shorts on Twitter and Instagram, and our messages are open. So, please do feel free to reach out to Hollywood Shorts if you have questions for me or anything else about VFX, um, or you can reach out to Caroline and the library and they were will pass along the um, things that are appropriate um for me to help be helpful and answer um caroline's going to tell you about our next upcoming schedule as we wrap up this year so um i hope josh and michael that you can hear everybody um virtually applauding for <laughs> all this great time yay thank, thank you kimberly for setting this up absolutely thanks so much happy holidays both to you and your families and happy holidays, everybody, as we begin the holiday season. Uh, we have one more class this year, which is crazy to me. Um, Caroline, take it away. Yeah, uh, th thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, uh, Michael and Josh um, and Kimberly. That was an amazing overview of everything. And I really loved hearing about all the different types and the inspiration at the end to just like keep going no matter what was particularly inspiring. So. Um, thank you so much. I'm so grateful. Um, and if you want to explore more about the topics we discussed today, we will be emailing out all the list of resources and a link to the recording of the presentation to everyone who registered. Our last Creative Career Path event for this season and the end of this year will be on Saturday, December 18th at 11 a.m., talking about the very important role of electrical and grip departments um, on a set um, or on a project. So to learn more about the Creative Career Path series and to register for that event, See past recordings and other resource lists go to uh, lacountylibrary.org slash creative career or creative dash career dash paths. Uh, link is in the chat for all of you. Um, and if you have any 
ideas about other kinds of professions you want to see featured as a part of the series in the future for next year, please share it with us. We want to hear what you want to learn about. Um, and if you're interested in participating in more of our upcoming virtual programs, please visit us at lacountylibrary.org. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Good night.